I'm Mike DeLuca. Welcome to this rare in the trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today I'm sitting with Paul Haggis, writer, director, producer, whose screenplay for Million Dollar Baby was nominated for an Oscar. Paul's also the co-writer and director and producer of the indie breakout hit Crash. Thank you, Paul, for being with us. Oh, thanks very much for having me. Now, first of all, you're Canadian. <laughs> which, we start with the tough questions. Oh, good. Which traditionally has meant you had one career option, comedian. Mm -hmm. So um, how did you end up writing uh, screenplays with such a distinctly American voice? Ah, good question. Uh, I have no idea. The, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess... It, Is it that our culture infects our neighbors to the north? Well, certainly. I mean, the, uh, uh, and, and comedian or, 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 or hockey player, I guess, is all, all, all I had, and I, and I couldn't play hockey. Uh, so, uh, no, it, 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 um, Canada really, uh, uh, we, we view Canada down here as, as the 51st state, and, right. and so we, we certainly view ourselves, well, I guess we don't view ourselves that way. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, growing up, I had, uh, 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 American cinema, American television had a, a large impact on me, as did... British and, and European cinema, uh, and so I, I, I think I, I, I grabbed both, I grabbed some from each. And, right. and it was... Do you feel it gives you a unique perspective on the kind of stories you want to tell, coming from the just certainly outside the Hollywood mainstream? Yeah, but doesn't everyone think they have a unique perspective? This uh, is true. Exactly. So yeah, I, I think I think it's a good for a writer to always be an outsider of some sort, and I, and I feel like an outsider uh, here. I'm a citizen, but I've lived here for I think 29 years now. Do you maintain a dual citizenship? Yes, I do. I finally, they finally let me become an American in uh, 2000. Is it true you used to move furniture for a living also? That's how I started, yes. I, uh, when I moved down here, um, uh, I, my, my dad actually uh, was the one who recommended I, I come to Hollywood. I, I was working construction with him in the summertime and working in theater in the, the wintertime. And he was actually producing some of the plays. And yeah, I think I wrote two of the worst pieces of theater ever to be, uh, uh, to be produced in Canada. And uh, I was driving down the road with him one day and going to a job. And he said, uh, construction, you're, you're no damn good at it, are you? And I said, no, no, I'm really not. He said, why don't you go to Hollywood? You know, it's, uh, you want to be a writer. You, 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 want, you want to work in, in, in film. Uh, your mom and I will support you best we can. And uh, so I went home and, and told my girlfriend at the time, we're getting married, and uh, I'm moving to Hollywood and be a writer. And she, obviously... So after the relationship thrilled. broke up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so we got married and packed up the, uh, the Ford Ranchero and, uh, and came down. And uh, one of my first jobs was for Moisha's Movers. Uh, Moisha, Moisha's Movers. Moisha was very good to me. Uh, and uh, $5 an hour cash and uh, worked there for like a couple of years. Yeah. Any similarities to, from that or construction to screenwriting? Uh, you know, I hadn't thought of it, but I'm sure I could come up with a few things. Exactly. I think uh, heavy lifting is, is generally uh, required in, in all those right. jobs. Had you thought about taking screenwriting seriously before your dad suggested it? I'd, uh, you know, I think I was in fifth grade, mm -hmm. uh, and I was a terrible student. I was, I was right. When, when I got to see my parents would you know, throw up a block party. Uh, the, uh, but it was, it was around fifth grade, um, I turned in a composition, and my teacher said, you're good at that. And that was it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a writer from that Enough on. That put the bug. Yeah, and uh, I wrote plays, and bad screenplays and, and bad, bad everything, uh, but really loved it. When did you first feel like you had what it took to be a screenwriter? Mm, when I was about uh, 40, I think, mm -hmm. after earning a very good living as a very bad writer for many years. Oh, hardly. <laughs> oh, no, no, really. Right. <laughs> I earned a very good living as a bad writer. No, I, I mean, I, I, did, uh, I was lucky enough to, uh, uh, to get uh, onto some sitcoms and, and things when I was like 26, 27, and wrote for uh, uh, a lot of a lot of fun shows, and, and somehow they, uh, uh, they they didn't seem to recognize that my work was really you know subpar. And um, what were some of the shows that you different were? strokes, different strokes, Facts of Life, One Day at a Time, uh, and and uh, uh, did worked my way up in television. I tried to, to I'd written some screenplays on spec and tried to sell them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, uh, I think what we call, call in the business, quite bad. And uh, <laughs> so it's a technical term we use as writers. Right. And so I'd optioned one or two. And, uh, and actually, I, I remember the first thing I sold was to, to Sir, Lou, Sir Lou Grade's company at the time. I sold a uh, psychological suspense thriller. And I uh, would be doing rewrites at night over at his company and going back to Facts of Life during the daytime. Mm -hmm. And one day I had to tell my producers, Facts of Life, I, I have to go over and, and they said, to, to this other thing. And they said, oh yeah, what are you doing? Well, I'm writing this erotic you know, uh, suspense thriller. And they went, 
get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, then, of course, I'm over there writing this, this thing and rewriting it. And, and I said, well, I have to go back to my day job on Facts of Life. And they go, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and and, and, I, and I, I've loved ever since trying to uh, sort of confound people's expectations of right. what you can do. You went to a film program at the Sherwood Oaks Experimental yes. College. What was that like? And, and, and That's right. I mean, that was when I was first here. Um, I mean, I knew nothing about writing. Mm -hmm. and This was before the TV career? Yes, okay. yes. Um, and Sherwood Oaks was uh, on Sunset Boulevard at the time, and no, Hollywood Boulevard. And um, you could just sign up to do a course, and, and, and uh, you would, uh, uh, some of them you had to send in a script in or something. And I had some very bad sample scripts, because I'd, I'd written like Welcome Back Cotter sample scripts mm -hmm. and all these things. Uh, and so uh, I managed to get, I think Lowell Gans was one of my teachers at the time. Uh -huh. he, he was on... Uh, Happy Days? Happy Days or Odd Couple or mm -hmm. one of those. And uh, there, there were several others. Stanley Myron Handelman taught me how right. to write comedy. And uh, it was wonderful. You're just getting these, these guys, these professional, you know, working people who could give right. you their, their input. Um, uh, and then Danny Simon. Uh, who, who uh, uh, I'd seen a, uh, an ad in the paper that Woody Allen said, Danny Simon taught me how to write. And mm -hmm. it's Danny was Neil's brother. So I, I, Danny d doesn't admit this actually cap happened, but when I, I sent my first script in, I said, you know, would you, can I come to your class? And he read it and had me over to his, his condo. So he goes, so this is, this is funny, right? I went, yeah, I said, show me, show me where it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and he went to his, this, it's not funny, no, you can't. And then years later, I went back when I was a big writer on like, Facts of Life, and he denied everything he said <laughs> that, of course. Because, <laughs> but, but it was true, it wasn't funny in the least. Well, comedy is so subjective. Yes. What does he know? Well, you if, actually, him. if you laugh, you know. <laughs> oh, right. you know. But uh, with the laugh track, and that helped a lot. You know. Well, um, do you feel an education in screenwriting from a from a formal institution is necessary to succeed in the business? Well, it didn't. You know, I, I didn't need one, and right. it just took me a lot longer. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it wasn't until. What was the most valuable part of that experience? Was it just getting to talk to working professionals? Being a working writer, I right. mean, sitting on the set, uh, and I mean, on your worst day, uh, you. you you know, and everyone just beat you up and told you what a rotten writer you were, and it was true, and you knew it. You'd, you'd go up and you'd sit in the bleachers and you'd watch them rehearse, and you'd go, look what I'm doing. I'm right. So there was no real, there was no substitute for actual working experience. No. I wasn't, it wasn't until 30-something, I think, that I actually figured out how to write. And I figured out what I should be doing as a writer, not how to write. And um, I turned in my first script, and uh, we, they just finished doing the pilot. And they said, uh, really, really interesting script, Paul, what's it about? And I said, well, it's, it's about this clever plot turn, it's right. about this, this piece of dialogue and this, this funny thing here. And they, yeah, we see that. But what does it mean to you? Where does it come from within you? And I said, it, it, it's supposed to do that? Hmm. And, and it just shook me up and I went back and I rewrote. And, and from that point to now, I've sort of tried very, very, it took a long, long time mm -hmm. uh, to sink uh, in, in, into this, what passes for my psyche. And, and uh, uh, but slowly, slowly I started to, uh, implement those things. Is there, what thing do you think in your life prepared you the most to be a screenwriter and a director and a producer now? Constant failure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Trial and error. Exactly. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I had very supportive parents. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I was terrible in school. I was thrown out of uh, every school I was in. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I think some things, I went to, uh, I think I was thrown out of, I was in Catholic Central High School. And, suspended, I think, five or six times in the first year, and my parents just were throwing up their hands, and they sent me to this quasi-military boarding school. Ooh, that sounds scary. Yeah, that was. And there, it was a great uh, education. Uh, it was a wonderful preparation for Hollywood, because I, during that one year, I learned to subvert any system. You know, I learned how to get around any, any uh, rule they had mm -hmm. or, or, or whatever uh, they were trying to force me to do, and uh, uh, it was, it was a fabulous education, so I guess that. You know. right. And for Million Dollar Baby are some of the bigger movies that, that you've worked on, certainly now with, with Crash being an, an unlikely giant hit. And, yeah, go um, figure. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, wow. um, you've, I think you've single, single handedly restored hope in the serious adult drama, which well, is kind of a genre. I think Lionsgate did that in the way they mm -hmm. released the film. I, I, I had very little to do with it, right. but it was, it, was, uh, uh, it's, it was nice to see its success. When you sit down to write these things, do you, uh, how big a factor does commerciality play into your line of thought, or None. if at all? None. None. Um, the, uh, when I decided to leave television, I... Uh, did you leave without a net? Like, did you have the feature set well, up already? No, I had nothing. No, I, I went home, and uh, we just finished building a new house. And, and, uh, and television, they pay you just 
a shitload of money. Right. And we're very grateful to take it. And I'd finished uh, this television show, and, and uh, it just uh, it wasn't making me happy, what I was doing. Uh, it, was a, it was sort of feeding my soul. And so I went home and, and talked to my wife. And uh, she'd been bugging me to write this movie, uh, Crash, for a while. I'd, I'd come up with the idea a year before. What's the genesis of the idea? It was, it was many jumping off points, but one, I was carjacked in 1991. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, these writers, we don't react like human beings react. You know, I, rather than rage or anger, um, I became curious about who these two kids would, or who stuck guns in my face. And it, uh, uh, it, it took a long time. Every, so every year or so, I'd think about them. And I'd mm -hmm. ask myself questions about them, because I, they were never caught. Right. So I, I just wondered who they were. And you know, were they best friends? Uh, had they just met each other that night? Um, and uh, you know, what, what was their worldview? Right. Uh, I didn't know. And so I never intended to write about them. Uh, but 10 years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. And, uh, and uh, I just said, damn. And I hate getting ideas in the middle of the night. Right. Because, so if you, you, you know what it's like. If you, if yeah. you, they will not be ignored. Well, no, it's worse than that. Because if, if you get up and write it down, you will have lost at least two hours sleep. Because right. you just can't get back to sleep. And you will read it in the morning, and it'll just be a piece of shit. Uh, but if you don't write it down, uh, and you say, oh, I'll remember it, I know it is, I'll remember it. Uh, you, you get up in the morning and will have forgotten it and know one thing, that it was the best idea of all time. Huh, right. And it's gone. So uh, this time I, w I woke up and wrote it down and then started asking myself who they, they bumped into because I've always, always been curious about the, the interaction of strangers mm -hmm. and how we affect each other. And so uh, I asked myself who they bumped into and that was easy. That was myself and my wife. So I fictionalized us and took us home. Right. Asked us what, I asked us what myself what I did, and I said, well, we changed the locks at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then, <laughs> I like asking myself difficult questions. I don't think writers should write about answers. I think we should write about questions. Mm -hmm. And the question I asked myself is, what if that person come to change the locks at 2 o'clock? What if he had been Hispanic, young, buzzed hair, mm -hmm. what looked in my ignorance to be gang tattoos, baggy pants? Would I have felt safe? Hmm. And I said, uh, no, I don't think I would have. Or, Ooh, that's, that's really dark territory. I have to right. write about this. So I brought him in and then I, he had one line in my outline and I said, well, he just heard these horrible things that Sandra Bullock's character would, would say. I wonder what happens to him. So I followed him and I just kept following the characters. I, right. uh, so I woke up, uh, so, so 10 o'clock in the morning, I had this entire 30-page uh, sort of outline done. And uh, I thought it was a TV series at first and tried to pitch it and uh, no one wanted to buy right. that. And a year later, after writing Million Dollar Baby uh, on spec, I was still unemployed. And uh, so I called my friend Bobby Moresco and said, I've got these pages. I, I think it's a movie. And he said, uh, no, it's not. And I said, I, I think it is. And so we wrote, and he said, well, we, well, we can make it into one. Mm -hmm. And uh, two weeks later, we had a, a first draft. How important is beating out the story or having an outline for you in your process? Or was that specific to this Project. You no, know, outlines there are really important. Um, knowing where you're going as a storyteller uh, is, is, is really important. Crash confounded me. Um, we did the cards and we sort of, no, I didn't think we did cards on that. We just sort of beat it out. I'd have to ask Bobby. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm a structuralist. I know what Act 2, Act 1 is, the, mm -hmm. Act 2, Act 3. I know, you know, I, I know it backwards and forwards. And Crash, I couldn't figure out what the structure was. I just kept following these characters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, one of the, I think probably the, the most dramatic event happens in the middle of Act Two. It just shouldn't be. It, you know, dr dramatically, it needs to be someplace else. But the story just wouldn't go in, in the way that, that right. I wanted to form it. And so we just kept following the characters and twisting Which them event around. in your mind was that? Uh, that, that was the, well, the most dramatic is probably the, the car fire. Okay. You know, and uh, at least the biggest piece. Mm -hmm. um, and it's certainly the, just where that, that story arc right. ends is in the middle of Act Two. Um, well, at least in the middle of halfway through the script. Right. So Crash was defying kind of what you're expected. Yeah, terrified. Theories us. about structure. It really terrified us. We had no idea what we were doing. I mean, the writing also terrified me. And uh, because as, as I was writing these characters, I turned to Bobby and say, you know, can we say this? And Bobby would say, you know, if it's true, we right. can say it. So we kept going. But no, I, 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 I was, I had, and we, then when I was finished, I didn't know uh, if it was a script or if it was a movie. Um, when we shot it, I didn't know it was a movie. Right. I just, uh, others told me it was, and uh, we got a little money to do it, so it became a movie. Are you surprised now that it's kind of come full circle and will be a 
a TV adaptation and a continuing series. That's a cool thing. It, uh, uh, yeah, it, I, I, hope it, I hope it succeeds. It's uh, because we had the arcs of where it would go for the right. first season and what would happen to these characters. I love twisting characters. In mm -hmm. a television series, you can do that. You just keep twisting them and twisting them right. and, and, uh, and subverting people's expectations about who these characters are. And, uh, because what I love writing about is the, the contradictions that we all embody as, mm -hmm. as human beings. I realize if, if right after 30 something, I, sometime after that, I realized if I was this screwed up, maybe other people were too. Right. If, I, if I could embody these contradictions, maybe others could, and so I started writing about them. And yeah, so that's, that's, it's wonderful being able to stretch that out for a television series. How did you approach writing uh, about experiences or, or cultures that you had no firsthand knowledge of? Like the, um, a lot of research. A lot of research. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I read at least 20 books. I mean, I, I, so we, I had the outline. I had what I wanted to do. And then long before I, 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 I called Bobby, I just started reading a lot. I just, and you know, finding things off the internet, you know, small self-published books or, 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 or other uh, uh, pieces of, uh, uh, of well-known uh, nonfiction and just reading about different cultures, different situations. Um, and I figured, I mean, People ask, how can you write about, how can you write those characters? Well, it's actually quite simple. Right. If you know the given circumstances of a person's life, but you have to know the specific given circumstances, then you just put yourself in that person's place and don't judge them. Mm -hmm. you know, know that everything that they've, every decision they make is true and right. And if you do that with every character, then it's very simple and easy to write it. Did that involve writing? character bios, or did you know the history of your characters before the movie starts? No, I let them tell me. I let the characters right. talk. And uh, um, uh, when, when we write, uh, when Bobby and I wrote that, it was just, we were just letting the characters talk to us. And, and, uh, and I asked Bobby recently, I said, someone asked us at a, a Q&A why we stopped writing the movie at the particular place, and I didn't know. So I asked Bobby, and he said, well, it's because the characters stopped talking. And in fact, if you see towards the end of the movie, the characters just stop talking. Yeah. So the movie's over. <laughs> so uh, so they, they just shut up. That's where we ended it. Yeah. What made you choose to, to have the bookends to kind of open and then, and then end where you, know, you kind of began with Cheadle? Um, I wanted somewhat of a mystery uh, mm -hmm. uh, construct. I wanted to fool the audience into thinking that's what this was. Right. Um, and, uh, like, where did this body come from? We're going to yes. find out how it got there. And exactly. then in the end, it's nothing we expected. Yes. Um, and because I, I knew I needed some sort of dramatic tension in this piece. Mm -hmm. And I figured maybe that'll give me some. Right. Um, so that's, that was the, the, the choice there. Um, and, you know, we were writing this on spec. I mean, I wrote uh, this. No one was going to pay us to write this. That's the other thing I pitched to Bobby. I said, right. I said Bobby, I got this 30 page outline. No one's going to pay us to do it, and it'll never sell. And he said, cool, sounds great. Huh. Uh, and same thing, I'd, I'd written Million Dollar Baby on spec. I'd, you know, I'd, I optioned the rights and got the book and the short stories. And, and knowing full well that no one would ever make right. that movie. It sounds like you should be running a studio. <laughs> because to pick those two projects to write on spec, I mean, that's a bullseye both times. You know, and it was dumb, because I should have chosen something that, uh, you know, that would sell. Right. That you would look and go do the next uh, Jerry Bruckheimer kind of film or, or, or whatever, do something that, that people, the studios are, are looking for. But I, I couldn't, and right. I didn't want to. And I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that writers make when they're, they're going. Well, I got to believe, uh, you know, somewhere you had faith that they would sell because you had an, a belief in their quality and that. that you know, there's still an appetite for the, the production and the distribution of films like that. I don't think that. I had faith, I'd hoped that they would hope. sell, but I don't think I had faith that they would. Mm -hmm. the, uh, 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 I, I just knew that I had to write something right. that meant something to me. And, uh, and you think some writers get in trouble by trying to second guess what will sell? I think a lot of young writers. I mean, I would have spoken at colleges or schools and, <clears throat> and uh, writers, after you give them the long spiel about how you write from the heart right. and all this stuff, the writers always ask, okay, but what are the people looking for? I said, no, stop, stop, stop thinking that right now. <laughs> right. Really good producers, the ones out there, don't look for that anyway. So yeah. They're looking for some, an individual voice. They're looking for a story that moves them. Right. And, and uh, if you start thinking, what, what do they want, and, and write that, then you're never right. going to reach down to that, that great right. place and, and, that, and discover and that, this. And thing. that steps on the territory of studio executives. If you take that away from studio executives, what do they have left? Well, I suppose, you know, it's agents, too. I think yeah. a lot of young agents try, try to right. help their clients by saying, well, this is what the, sure. this, this Paramount's looking for. Right. Well, that's one, one example. Maybe they are looking for that. And, but I don't think if you write for it, they'll find that in you. Right. It's sort of happenstance that they find that. How important uh, is it for you to keep situations real and authentic in, when you're writing about contemporary life? Does it lead you into a lot of research? You have to ground all the characters, obviously. Mm -hmm. All the characters have to be real. 
Uh, even, you know, you look at you know, uh, John Cleese's character in Faulty Towers. Uh, that character is completely real. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and completely realized by the actor uh, and, and in the script. Uh, so it, it doesn't really matter what, what right. uh, kind of reality you're writing. It has, it has to be the, the, the verisimilitude. Uh, it, it, uh, that's a lovely word, isn't it? Verisimilitude. I love that word. Isn't yeah. that great? Exactly. But it, it just has to ring true. Well, there's a, when Richard Donner was doing the first Superman movie, you mm -hmm. know, the, the original Christopher mm -hmm. Reeve film, he replaced a British director, Guy Hamilton, um, and really, Richard Donner felt very strongly that this is an American character and it should be an American director. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he did was hang that word verisimilitude up in every department, mm -hmm. meaning people have to believe this guy can fly. Like mm -hmm. even, in, even in a fantasy film, yes. there was a, a real ambition to keep it mm -hmm. authentic. Did he put the definition up there with it? Or just um, no, people were on their own. They okay. left to their own devices <laughs> exactly. on that score. <laughs> to get the cadence of people's dialogue and real life conversations, did you, did you end up recording like no, just no, I people's just, conversations? No, I just didn't. Kinda, I wish I had. Right. Um, or is that I, something you just kind of make up as you go along because of just things you remember from life itself? Characters, it, 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 at certain point, it's no longer volitional. Right. You know, by the time you're writing dialogue, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be Because I think a lot of people analytical. wonder, how do you keep, how, can, how does a writer keep characters sounding like all different people? Yeah, I think if you hop, if you really can hop back and forth into the, into the bodies of right. those characters, rather than just writing yourself mm -hmm. and all the characters, I mean, we all do write right. ourselves. But if you can really hop into those, then they won't sound alike. If you because once you're writing that character's dialogue from their point of view, it can only sound that way. So the real trick is to really, almost like an actor becomes a character, you have to become that character. Yeah, oh, completely. As you're writing, the characters talk and, and right. you're there. And it's, I would love sometimes to put a camera on a writer while they're writing. It, it, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's got to be the best show right. in town because you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're, we're terrible hams. Right. And, uh, well, at least it, if an actor comes up to you and goes, what's my motivation? You've been there. You can yes. tell them the whole story. Uh, but unfortunately, writers usually tell them in, 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 in a way that the actors can't understand. Right. Uh, is we will tell them the result of, of, of what, uh, uh, you know, how we got there right. uh, isn't as important as, as how we exactly want the word to sound, right. and, which is a, a big mistake. You know, you were able to, to handle subject matter that traditionally has kept people away from theaters, like handling race and contemporary American culture has always been, you know, kind of almost the third rail of, of movie stories. Why do you think Crash connected in a way that you just, you know, totally leapt over that and, as a concern and, and actually made people talk about the movie and come see the movie? It didn't keep people away. I have no idea. I, I uh, thank you for saying it did. Um, I, uh, I think probably because when we were writing it, you know, when, we, when I created the characters and Bobby and I wrote the script, we were really looking at, uh, at people just trying to get through the day. Right. Uh, this woman wanted to try to keep her marriage together. This man wanted to try to keep his job and his dignity, and he couldn't have both. Right. Uh, uh, this person was just was trying to, 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 to be forgiven. Uh, this person, right. Whatever they were, it was just that. And when I put them all under pressure, uh, things came out of their mouths. But, for example, with you know, the, the Jean character, Sandra Bullock's, the Sandra Bullock plays, mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe that if, if not for those circumstances, those words would never come out of her mouth. She, she, if it wasn't that she just, you know, that she thought her husband was cheating on her, right. if, she was, if it wasn't that they'd just been carjacked and that she came home and then now finds that woman in her house, right. and then her husband, rather than taking her seriously, is patronizing her and is telling her, just okay, everything goes to bed. If not for all those things, that hatred would never boiled up and those words would right. never come out. So you have to... Which is a great metaphor for just how it, ha it happens to everyone in the first place. Yes. And then I mean, you have to know all that and then forget it all that, forget that all so it, it doesn't end up in the script. Right. It only ends up in the actor's mind and the director's mind because, of course, then you'll have the life that comes before the scene and, and right. it's going to be after. But it won't have, you want to explain everything. So the, the universality was a key concern, you know, touching on things that, you know, that make people feel uncomfortable or make people feel a certain way towards another group of I people. I really, really looked at what made me feel uncomfortable right. the most. And uh, whenever I was really anxious about something, I knew I was in the right territory. I had to keep going. And whenever my characters were feeling too good about themselves, right. uh, I knew that uh, the gods had to come along and kick their legs up when right. the chair. Well, what's great about the film, too, is it, it, it manages to find its way back to what we can all relate to about what we want in our own lives. You know, whether it's Matt Dillon dealing with his father, you know, you know, we've all felt put upon at a certain point by, by responsibilities or things that we wish we weren't. Yeah, Matt, Matt's with. character came from a, a piece of hate mail I received when I was doing a uh, uh, television show. <clears throat> and I'd written an episode. What possible hate mail could 
Facts of Life inspire. Yeah, no, exactly. For different strokes. This was Family Law. It was the last show I did for television and uh, before writing mm -hmm. the movies. And, and uh, I was, it was a, a, an interracial couple that week on the show. Mm -hmm. And someone wrote in to say, why is it in television that it's always the, the white people who are the villains and the black people who are the victims? Let me tell you a story about my father. And he went on in this letter to tell me the story that Matt Dillon tells about his father. And I read this and I went, I was overwhelmed. I said, you think that, that bigotry and intolerance and racism comes, was well, passed from one generation to the next. And in this case, it's not. This, this, this man, this good mm -hmm. man, set out to, to live a certain way and to teach his son life lessons that, were, that reflected his own you know, ideology. And because of circumstances, the opposite came true, and his son learned wow. the, 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 the opposite lesson that was intended. And I thought, wow, that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, we're so complex as human beings, right. and, and we tend to tell our stories so simply. Mm -hmm. And well, telling a, a story simply is a terrific idea, but right. telling a story about simple characters never is. Right. So that, that letter was the genesis of Matt Dillon's uh, scene with the clerk in the... Exactly. And once I had that, and right. I, I knew how to go back and forth. How do you approach writing for women? Because, you know, you, you had... Certainly, Million Dollar Baby was one of the best written oh, female you. roles in a, in a long while, and now in Crash, very strong female characters. Oh, thank you. Again, it's just the given circumstances of a person's life. One of, the, one of them's being born a woman, right. and and just really knowing what that is, as much as a man can understand that. Right. Uh, Did that come? Do you talk to your, your wife about? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of that? Yeah. Uh, in fact, in, in Crash, uh, Jean's character, I knew the, the Sunday Bullock character. I knew there was before she was ever on. I knew there was a scene missing that I wanted to put in. And I asked Deborah about, about it. She read the script and she was saying that, you know, it's, it, she has this anger and I have these friends who, who wake up with this anger. And I went, oh, and so we, we, I, I riffed back and forth with her. And I, oh, yes, I understand that you, you wake up with that kind of anger, anger every day and don't know why. Right. And that has to be um, really unsettling to not know why you're angry all right. the time. And be looking for a reason and thinking grab onto a reason and that reason's taken away from you and you're still angry. Right. And so. I'd like to discuss if we could a scene that you've cited as a, a particularly strong example of your work in that film, and uh, I would certainly agree. It's the scene where Matt Dillon and Ryan Felipe pull over Tandy Newton oh, and yeah. Terrence Howard, and I, I think everyone, you know, you, you talk about the, the scene where he, later in the film where he rescues her mm -hmm. in the car, but, but, that, but the scene that kind of kicks off their storyline, their, their story arc, um, has made a huge impact uh, with, with the critics who always cite that scene when they reviewed the film. Was that a hard scene to come up with in terms of how pivotal it was and how many things happened in that scene? No, it was, it was easy to come up with. It was hard to write only because you feel so guilty as a writer writing those things. And then doubly hard to direct because, you know, it's, at least it's on the page when right. you, and you've got actors and, and, and that and, and you think, oh, it's fine, we've got this right. scene, we're shooting. And then you start to see it come to life and, uh, and you, this, this, you're, you're overwhelmed with guilt right. for, for making these characters go through this uh, and these, these actors go through it. it was, uh, and the actors were wonderful. And right. uh, it was, uh, but that, was, yeah, that was a particularly hard scene. I mean, too, you're, 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 you're meeting three characters for the first time I think, in that scene. Um, uh, you're, you're four, I four. Guess, exactly. and you're starting, you know, uh, two. I think two or three storylines in that scene. It just felt like. It, did it help you as the as the director to to be the writer on that scene? So you kind of knew, you knew where you wanted text and subtext to go ahead of ahead of time. Hmm. Do you think it would have been harder to be the writer of that scene and have and hand it off to a director? It's always hard. It's to always hard. It's always hard to hand it off um, the, in any scene because you can. It's amazing. You know, in television, as you're the, the the writer and the executive producer, when you write a script, you think everything is self-evident. Right. You think there's no way anyone can misunderstand right. a, a scene because it's it's clear what. To, and I, I like writing scenes in which everything is in subtext. You, right. you, you don't you don't what people are talking about is you know frying an egg, but in fact right. it's it's really the fact that I'm leaving you is, yeah. is, is the scene about. And uh, and so then you get and, you, and the director shoots it and it's about frying an egg right. and you go, and they're both right. very happy about the egg frying and right. or whatever it is and and, it, and you're like. <laughs> so, so it's always hard, I, right. I think. You have well, to. You, you manage to, speaking of text and subtext, you actually ex kind of, in your film, delineate the TV experience and the feature experience because you've got a scene with Terrence Howard where it's clearly not a director's medium, television, no. you know, just based on what he goes through. No. In the scene with Tony Danza, and then obviously with film, it is more of a director's medium. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd humili humiliated uh, so many directors in my yeah. life that I had to sort of put that on screen and show Yeah, and I thought Tony Danza did an incredible job. Wasn't he great? 
actor, producer of a TV I, series. I called up Tony and said, uh, I've got a scene. I feel like you're doing a movie in, in a movie. He said, okay. He said, do you want to read it? He said, no. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, I'll do it. Right. Well, I'm sure he was waiting for that phone call for a while. It was, it was, I, I love working with Tony. Right.